Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Henderson. We have New York Times best-selling author Lori King and her new novel about Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes is called Dreaming Spies. Lori, welcome to Naperville and Anderson. Thank you. It's so great to have you. We've been so excited that you were coming to it's, see us. It's so lovely book. to be back. So, Dreaming of Spies. Dreaming Spies. Dreaming oh, Spies. Dreaming Spies. There we are. I know. It's only been out since the 17th. Yeah. So, a little over a week and a half or so. And yeah. hitting bestseller lists. Wow. So, so what are you hearing from your readers? Because you have a legion of them. And, and what are you hearing? Maybe somebody who's new to the series. What, what are you hearing from those readers? They're having a good time. Yeah. This is a book they've been looking forward to for a while because I've been I've been sort of mentioning the Japan adventure for oh four books now. Yeah, right. <laughs> they've been waiting they've for been a while. Waiting for it. But yeah. since I hadn't gone to Japan until two years ago, I I, I can write the book. Right, right. So um, yeah. yes, they're having they're having a great time, and it's this is one of those. One of the most more classic of the Russell and Holmes adventures. There's um, exotic places, disguises, preferably in male, female, fem female, male. I mean, that's always a, you get extra points for cross dressing. Um, <laughs> you know, learning a, learning a, an impossible language and being in an exotic place. Yeah. Oh, and, and yeah. danger, of course. Yeah. I mean. So I know you've been mentioning this about the, about getting to Japan, you know, yeah. getting them to Japan. But where did the seed for the actual plot of the story, you know, with the, with the all the intrigue and the the sort of uh, blackmailing and everything that occurs in this? Where, where did that sort of start to grow? Well, the this? blackmail is a thing that um, that Conan Doyle makes sure that you know. This is, this is something that Sherlock Holmes really, really disapproves of blackmail. He, it's his the very lowest of the low. Um, a reserve for blackmailers, and and so that's sort of been in the back of my mind for a while. But I needed something that could span these three sections of the book. There's the first section is on this cruise ship, right. this claustrophobic little world that drives Mary Russell mad. Then Japan, where they're there in this beautiful, strange, weird, interesting culture, and then in her home in Oxford. Um, and so I needed an object that would tie those three places and a period of time that covers over a year. Um, and, and so there's this book about a journey. Yeah, yeah. So Mary Russell, so it's been 20 year, over 20 years now since the first book. And this is the 12th, 12th book in the series. So this Thir is 13. 13. This Thir is 13. 13th book in the yeah. series. And the first one being The Bee Cooper's Apprentice. Right. And, and seeing Mary, you know, you start it when she's 15 years old. You know, she sort of stumbles across um, Sherlock Holmes, you know. He's, on the he's, Sussex Downs. On the Sussex Downs. Yep. He's retired. He's learning about beekeeping or wants to be a beekeeper or actually doing this or whatever. So knowing how she has grown and matured, has this been a really cool journey for you personally to see how this character that you created? Yeah. Because yeah. um, the first one started with the idea that it would be a, a coming-of-age story of this young woman with yeah. an extraordinary mind. Right. You know, she is a young female feminist 20th century version of Sherlock Holmes. And so the idea was that I would look at how that mind develops and how it's similar to that of Holmes, but how it's different. Right. And, um, and so the first, the first couple of books, um, she's very young, and she's now in her, in her 20s. And I, I think it's it's indeed interesting to watch her both develop as a person and as a partner to to Holmes. Right. And I I think you've written in what so much of us have liked with all the, the reincarnations of Sherlock Holmes, whether it's been on the big screen, the small screen, and other books and everything. I think you've created sort of a relationship that we've always hoped for Sherlock Holmes, you know, <laughs> in a way. But but also that you know it's just seen this this intellectual equal, but yet you know sort of a sparring partner, someone who can be there with him but be a, an equal partner and not yeah. just the you know yeah i don't know that i agree with my local paper had an article for um valentine's day that was also a book review and the title was sherlock in love mm, and i i don't no, know that i yeah. really agree with that yeah um it is definitely a partnership and there's probably love somewhere in there but we don't talk we're english we don't talk about <laughs> those things <laughs> So I know you've been asked this, this question probably a gazillion times. 
But how much of you is Mary, or even of Sherlock, the Sherlock that you have in, in your stories? Might, might be some of your, your husband, or, or, <laughs> or, or even you, even the Sherlock. Which, but how, I know some of it is you, but a lot maybe not. I think that the, the similarities are, are, are there, but mostly on the surface. Okay. Um, there are certain areas of overlap, such as Russell's interest in religion. And that I think is probably one of the yeah. one of the more striking ones. But the other things, you know, she's tall, she wears her hair up, she has glasses, and she's married to a, married to an older man. You know, that yeah. that's really not terribly right. terribly okay. in depth. But um, I think in any in any especially series of novels that a writer produces, there is some degree of you know autobiography. Um, if nothing else, it's an autobiography of fantasy. And I know that I would have loved the Russell books when I was a teenager. Yeah. This is something yeah. I would have, I would have been one of those right. girls who sits in the front row at my events and says, yeah. Mary <laughs> Russell, I, I am Mary yeah, Russell. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And it's so great to have a, a female character like this. You know. she, is a, she is a role model in many ways. Yeah. And it's so interesting, all the reincarnations of Sherlock Holmes, the ones that we have on TV right mm -hmm. now, and, you know, the only one that has a female sort of Watson character, but still is not quite the equal, is that elementary show, you know? Yeah. It's so interesting, but so this is, to me, this really is, this is a partnership, and in a way, sometimes she sort of ups him on, on some certain occasions. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, I think, the joy of the thing, um, and probably one reason why young girls like it so much is that she does get the better of him. The mm -hmm. first time they meet, she roundly insults him um, and, yeah. <laughs> and fools him. So it's it's deeply satisfying. Well, yeah. I think we're all cheering at <laughs> those, those moments, you know. Yeah. So tell us about Japan. I know you've mentioned it in previous novels in the series, mm -hmm. and, and you've finally gotten there. And there's a couple of characters that I absolutely loved in this, and also all the haiku that you wrote at the beginning of each chapter. Was that fun or was it one of those, oh, or was it a struggle well, sure. no, <laughs> to no, come up I with mean, that, that 575, you know, yeah. format for a no, haiku? No, you just keep sticking words together until you get the right number of syllables. I mean, they're all bad haiku, but they are haiku. I they were pretty good. No. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> were they fun to do though? At yeah. The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, did, we did those and I also did a couple on a poster that we've done for the indie booksellers. And yeah, and, yeah I mean, it's, it's it's very much in the Holmesian style mm -hmm. of the telegraphic prose, you know. In the Conan Doyle stories, they're forever communicating by these quick telegrams, and and so that's Holmes's preferred style. And I thought this it sort of goes with the whole yeah. Russell and Holmes world is these telegraphic communications that are squeeze down into it's 17 a, syllables. Yeah, or a different kind of format. that you, Yeah, it takes a little bit of intellect to figure them out a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so in so many of these books, the place where you set them, it becomes a character. Yeah. And so making Japan, tell, tell us a little about, and I know you said you, you visited there a couple of years ago. Tell us what kind of research you did into the culture, the language, and everything that you brought to this story. Well, in, in the 1920s, the book is set in 1924, Four right. and 25, but Japan is 24. And in 1924, there was not a huge amount of tourism. I mean, this, Japan was not a central tourist mm -hmm. attraction. Um, but that that meant that a lot of people who went there, who did go there for various reasons, um, because it was off the beaten track, they wrote a book about it, which was very good, helpful for me. Because there's all these odd books out there by, you know, an ambassador's wife and, a, and this Bolshevik guy who wanders around the world and talks to people and walks through countries. And, um, and it's, um, it, it gives you an immediacy that, you know, a guidebook is handy, but uh, if there isn't one, these, right. these, are, yeah. these are even better. So, yeah, it was, it was the sort of thing that enabled the country to come alive. Um, mm -hmm. When we went there, I went with a couple of friends, and we made a point of going into the more rural areas of Japan, which there are many rural areas of Japan, believe it or not, um, including the, the road that Russell and Holmes walk up, the Kiso Kaido Road. And um, I was very pleased in one place to see this, this sign 
a warning sign with this little black thing in the middle, which when you got closer, you saw it was a warning sign for bear. <laughs> which you, you wouldn't think. So, you wouldn't think it's a pan. So right? I had to have a bear in my book. So poor <laughs> Russell meets a bear. Yeah, which is just, just fantastic. <laughs> So, so the other research, you know, and I know, I think you did a little research on the Queen Mary. Did yeah. You? Did you go into, so because, you know, you talk I'm, about her. And, yeah, because she hates being on this ship. Yes. Right? So, so tell us a little bit about going, because I've been on that boat, and it's really, it's something. Yeah. What I needed was somebody who could um, interpret for me. The Queen Mary is now a hotel, and you can go and stay on it. It's a lovely hotel. It's a very, very interesting place. And what I needed was someone who could interpret what I what I would see. It's a slightly different time frame, but um, nonetheless very very similar. Um, and and so you know I poked around and and the <clears throat> the gentleman who does these tours mm -hmm. tells you all these oddities and and there were a couple of books that were also written that were very handy about the Queen Mary and one. Um, a, a sort of guidebook to cruising by oh, this very okay. flippant gentleman in the late 20s. And so yeah. they're very helpful for things like learning that the way to um, get a table is to bribe the purser. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, that's, something that's, I wouldn't have thought no, of, not well, being exactly, an experienced exactly. cruiser. Right, right, right. Now, there is a famous poet that you feature him. He sort of mm -hmm. features in the story. He's, he's, he's dead, of course, in the story. Yeah. But he was, he was extremely influential from the 17th century Japan. Mm -hmm. um, Haruku Sato, right? Uh, Basho. Uh, Basho, I Basho, mean. yeah. Basho. And from the Edo period. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting that you featured some of his, his stuff and he sort of features in the story. Yeah, yeah. 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 Basho was a wandering poet. He was yeah. a master of the haiku yeah. and he basically just wandered wandered up and down the land and wherever he went he wrote poems about yeah. it which is great if you're talking about wandering up and down the land <laughs> right, so, right yeah. yeah yeah I thought that was really cool mm -hmm. but Haruko Sato her character yes who uses haiku just yes. like you know and very mysterious so so tell us a little bit about her and how she be well, without spoilers without features, spoilers without spoilers please. Yes, yes 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 that's always yeah. the tricky part yes, I know I know we can only say certain things um <laughs> It's interesting to write a character who is, on the one hand, a sort of, um, she, she is what you expect when you think of a Japanese woman, small and petite and sort of shy. Um, and, and, then, and then this other side of her opens up and you think, ah, oh, well, perhaps the culture is like that as well, that um, Japan looks like a place that's very ordered and very neat and tidy and very controlled. And yet, it also has this other side yeah, of right. um, that both Haruki and her father um, show. Yeah, I, th I thought she was a great character. Thank you. Great character. So, writing suspense, and you know, all of these sort of say a novel of suspense. Yeah. You know, that, but they're on there. I'm always curious how how do you keep it suspenseful for you as a writer when you're writing and outlining? <laughs> oh, outlining because these are memoirs from from Mary's perspective. Right. And you're you're kind of going back and forth with time with yeah. this a little bit, yeah. but how do you, how do you how do you set forth the story and the plot and keep yourself engaged in the story? Because well, it's, it's, I think it's got to be a pretty fine trick. You know? it, it helps a lot, a lot that I don't uh, I don't outline, so it's okay. all a suspense to me. See, I as think I'm that's going so cool. along, that is so cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I I always have a sort of idea where the okay. story's going. And I know what I'm writing towards, right. but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get there. Yeah. And and so yes, the suspense is there from the yeah. from the beginning. Well, I think that's why everybody says they're 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 so good that way because okay. well Thank no because you. they're surprising you as much as you're surprising us. Right? You know, it's so. it's just an interesting. I mean, yeah. th there's a wide variety of ways of writing. Um, in in yeah. my world, and some people are devout outliners, mm -hmm. and some people mm -hmm. it just were not outliners yeah. at all, yeah. and, uh, and and I am one of those. Yeah. So with a with a BA and an MA in in, in theology, but you also have an honorary doctorate too. Yeah. Um, how has that education informed your writing and and writing this series and some of your other novels? How do you think that has informed? Well, I I use theology and religion a lot in the books. Um, this doesn't have an awful lot, I mean bits and pieces, not an awful lot, but um, some of the books much more than others. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's one of the real strengths of crime fiction, of the mystery world, that so long as you're telling a story that the, the plot hangs together and the machinery of the plot comes t together, um, you, can, you can make use of any human passion. Anything yeah. that people feel passionately about is grist for murder. Sure. Right. Oh yes, that's true. <laughs> so I, I think, um, I mean, you can you can write a book about um, greed, revenge, political power, um, or or religion, um, and anything like that is a uh, is is, is great a good fodder. Source. Great yeah. fodder. Yeah, yeah. So so those 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 ideas or themes of substance that that those those kind of bring into really add so much more meat. To these stories. I so, like yeah. the kind of novel, and especially historical novels, that deal with substantial issues. Right. I don't think that you need to feel like you're taking notes on the book, um, because I think primarily my purpose is entertainment. That's my job. Yeah. But at the same time, if I can leave ideas in the reader's mind, um, it's satisfying both for me and for them. Well, and I, th I think too when you when you turn that last page, it stays with you for a long time because it makes you think. Mm. And they make they make great books for discussion, you know, and especially book groups and things like that. They're Thank really you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Sherlock in this is about thirty years older than Mary. Yeah. About that. And how how is that kind of relationship? add to the dynamics of the story and their relationship because it's so interesting to hear that she is so incredibly intelligent and intuitive but yet that you know she, he is so much older but yet the, this this partnership is really unique yeah well it's <clears throat> there's a couple of things going on there one of them is in the period that I'm writing about in the teens and 20s um, the Great War meant that an entire generation of young men was simply not available to their normal mate. Um, this huge slice of the population was either killed, severely injured, or devastated emotionally by their, their service in the Great War. So young women like Russell tended to marry outside their expected groups. And one of those areas was age. You found a lot of, of cross-generational marriages that you perhaps wouldn't Wouldn have see. before the war. Um, so there's, there's that background in, in it. But from a more personal point of view, I was married to a man who was 30 years older than I was. And it was something that his, um, his background of being, having been born in India was much more of a barrier to uh, to understanding than the fact that he was older right. than I, right. yeah. so it's. Um, I think that it's it's one of those one of those areas that my insight allows Russell to right. wander along in her own world. Yeah, right. So, Oxford Library plays a role in this book too. The and Bodleian Library. The Bodleian Library, yes. and it's so interesting how the Bodleian Library ends up in other pieces of fiction too because oh. it's this it's this wealth and depth of mystery and everything no one knows you know these volumes that you can pull from the depths of the library oh no not you you can have pulled for you from pulled the for you yes you don't you don't touch them you don't touch no yes. no 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 yeah, yes. white gloves and everything they will fetch them for <laughs> they you they will fetch you if you call them up but tell us a little bit about that place because it's i i find well, it fascinating it, um, one of the differences between Russell and Holmes has, has always been her um, interest in matters theological and academic. And um, famously, you don't, you don't even know what university um, Sherlock Holmes went to because there is a university mention, but you don't know whether it's Oxford or that other place, yeah. Cambridge. Right. Yes. Um, so I... I because I know Oxford, my husband went there, we had a house there, um, I worked in the Bodleian. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that Russell should be an Oxford student. And, um, and because of who she is, she would adore the Bodleian Library. I mean, that would be her, her heart's home. So when this, this object, that this book that, that you followed um, all through the Japan and the rest of it, resurfaces in England. It's most natural that it would be resurfacing in the Bodleian Library. Right. So I had to write a letter to the Bodleian and to say that 
I was terribly sorry, I apologize profusely, but in my book, um, someone has stolen one of their books, and they, they wrote and forgave me for that oh. sin. <laughs> I love that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. You're safe. All's cool. Okay. You, know, you won the Edgar Award, a Lambda Award, and then the Beekeeper's Apprentice was named as one of the top, you know, crime novels of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Winning those awards and having that, that, that sort of accolade, is it hard to sit down and write? Or it did that, was that just, thanks, but, you oh, know, I... Yeah, no, I, it's, yeah. it's hard to sit down and write, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. I mean, there's can be, right. you can have academies sure. on the side, and each day is, is a new terror. Yeah, yeah. So, The Red Circle. So, tell yes. me about the Baker Street Irregulars and being inducted into that Sherlock... Yeah, so when I when I was first yeah. writing the Russell stories, um, the the Sherlockian world um, didn't quite know what to make of me. I think they were expecting that I was going to be writing some odd sort of erotica. <laughs> you know, Interesting. Sherlock and his young girlfriend, you know. But when <clears throat> when time went by and. Um, yeah. And it was fairly obvious that I had a tremendous amount of respect, not only for the character of Holmes, but for the writer Conan Doyle. They, they, they backed off a little and said, well, okay, you, you know. We'll. When my really steamy scenes are those that he brushes her hair, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think they, I think they forgave me my, my nerve of seizing the great man. But... Um, they uh, they eventually asked me to 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 go to the Baker Street Irregulars annual dinner okay. in New York and give a paper on Watson's war wound, and were so impressed by it that they in, inducted me into the Baker Street Irregulars. So I am now an official BSI. That's wonderful. That is, what, I think that's an incredible honor. <laughs> yeah. So so with everything that's Sherlockian that's out there now, you know, with the shows and Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, playing. And what is it about Sherlock Holmes and, and the Conan Doyle stories that sort of remain just, they're sort of timeless and they keep, you know, reincarnations in different different ways? Oh, they are, they are, as you say, timeless. Yeah. Um, Holmes is, is a sort of archetypal figure. He is a figure of um, a, the superman who works with very human tools. He is an intellect. Um, he is a, a man who uses his cold reasoning power, but is driven by a passion for justice. I mean, he burns white hot with fury at the idea that somebody would get away with something. And I think that combination of someone who pits himself in all his humanity against, um, against evil is very appealing. So, social media. You know, over 20 years writing the first one, things have changed a bit, you know, in 20 years. What it's done for authors, how they connect with their readers. You know, I know you have a pretty extensive blog that you, you know, you talk to all your readers. And, yeah. and even Mary has her own Twitter account. Mary Russell at yeah. 115 is a regular <laughs> tw Twitterer, tweeter, tweeter. Tw She's regular on Twitter. Yes, let's say it that way. Those old hands of hers must be doing it. <laughs> She could, but she can get it out in those those characters. But it, it, it's really changed though since you know, and it yeah. Does it does it suck up a lot of time? I always ask many authors this because it, it you could really spend a lot of time, you know, connecting with your readers through social networking. But you know, it, but it it really has opened up a lot for, yeah. for for readers and authors. I I don't I don't tend to get sucked in as much as some people yeah, do. I think okay. I tend to do my media stuff, Facebook and the rest of it in the mornings, and then I don't tend to look the rest yeah. of the day. Um, I do tend to use certain things um, when I have a new book coming out, so that my I indulge my inner academic by yes, publishing a series of blog posts about aspects of the new novel, um, little snippets of text, and then I talk about you know, whether it's the Emperor of Japan or the Bodleian Library or um, illustrated right. books or whatever it is, some aspect of researching the book that, um, you know, that I think people would find interesting. And so yeah. we, we do that as the lead up. And I also have found that, um, that Pinterest is very useful for a writer. 
um, because it enables you to give a visual background of the book. Yeah, that's so I put a lot of my own photographs and a lot of um, vintage stuff yeah. from the 20s on the Pinterest pages. Well, it's, yeah. it's as a tool for illustrating the background of the book. It's very, very useful. Well, it adds so much more richness to, to your reading experience. Yeah. So it informs it a lot more. Yeah. So that's wonderful. So what are you working on now? And, and is it going to be a, a part of this series? Or are you giving yourself a break or waiting, you know, maybe doing um, it? I, I had started the book um, that my editor and I were both really excited about. It was a, <clears throat> it was a, it's a contemporary thriller. Mm -hmm. um, and I was about a third of the way through it when I made the mistake of having a conversation with my editor. And she and I feed into each other's fantasies in ways that probably shouldn't be permitted. Um, because I, yeah. when I came away from the meeting, I found that I had put aside the contemporary thriller that I was a third of the way into and started a new project about which I had no idea. I had done no research, and I had yet the same deadline. <laughs> so so we're coming up to, up to speed right. really fast yeah, with this okay. one. All right. um, and it's, it is going to be in the world of... Russell and Holmes, mm -hmm. but with a major twist. Ooh. Oh. Say no more. We, we look forward to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, be April 2016. Okay. Great. Okay. Laura, I end these little interviews with a quiz. So this is lightning round. You know all the answers. Oh, no. So whatever comes to mind. Okay. Most of them are, they're, they're book, they're literary oriented. So you know the answers. Okay. What was your favorite chi book as a child when you were young? Oh, I, I, I know would it's hard. probably say uh, the Black Stallion books oh. by, by Walter Farley. I think the, the fantasy of those and the Island Stallion were just deeply satisfying. Yeah. I read all those horse books. I, you, you realize I, I never rode a horse. I mean, I never had a horse. I didn't either. In, I read all those too. Deeply satisfying. Yeah. Okay, what is your favorite Arthur Conan Doyle story? Hound of the Baskervilles is just genius yeah. in how he... Um, how he pulls together these dark gothic sensations and makes a story out of them. I think yeah. it's great fun. Okay, and how about a book, of any book you've ever read, that you could not tell enough people to read it? You know, that book you're really a, an evangelist for. Oh, Gods of Gotham, probably one. Okay. Yeah. But I think that the Josephine Tay series is probably oh, another one, okay. because not a lot of Americans know her, and her stuff is just so good, so good. Okay, how about something when your kids were young that you loved curling up and reading together? A picture book or whatever? When my kids were very young, I think my daughter would have been seven and my son four, we read The Complete Lord of the Rings. Can you imagine? Wow! A four-year-old, he was five by the time we finished, and he wanted to start over again. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay, and how about something you're reading now or read recently that you really loved? Um, oh dear, well, I, I'm so bad with names. Um, William Gibson's new one, The Peripheral. Right. I love books that, as a writer, I, I learn from. And a book like that, I mean, not only is it a brilliant story, but it's fascinating to watch how a man can tell a story without explaining things. I mean, it's a science fiction thing, but it's, he, doesn't, he doesn't stop and go back and explain stuff, which is really fun. Yeah, that's great. Okay, 100%, A+. Plus. Oh, good score. Hey. <laughs> Lori, thanks so much for sitting down and talking with me. Thank you. And congratulations on Dreamy Spy. Oh, thank you. And come back and see us next time. I hope so. What a suspenseful conversation we just had with Lori King, New York Times bestselling author, about her new novel. It's the 12th in the Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes series. It's called Dreaming Spies. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed. Mm -hmm.